Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Bob DeWay, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Eric Dalma, the pastor of Gospel of Grace Fellowship. And last week we were speaking about the Lord's Prayer and how it's used by dominionists as proof that they're commissioned to rule over the world, to take dominion over the seven mountains. We're talking about this book, promotes the seven mountain mandate that you hear about, especially when there's a big election going on. And we're going to take over things and Christianize the world, make it a great place, and eventually invite the Lord to come back. And Eric and I gave a totally different view. Because yeah. they cite the Lord's Prayer for, for proof, and we have to doubt they they have one clue what the Lord's Prayer is even about. That's right. I yeah. wonder if one of these guys could even exegete the Lord's Prayer carefully for an adult Sunday school class and get it right. Yeah, well said, Bob. And it's funny, as you and I were talking just between the sessions here, you, our big lament is the fact that the post-millennial teachers like this Bill Johnson and Lance Wall know, they really belittle the promises that Christ is praying for in the Lord's Supper, this idea that we would be given our daily bread, our, our daily needs, the fact that we would be rescued, the fact that God's name would be made holy. It's as if these things aren't sufficient. And the trapping, I think, for the American evangelical today is a lot of us are depressed about the state of our nation And we buy into this lie that somehow there used to be a Christianized version of America where there are certain nations in the world that have some covenant with God. And what Bob and I are saying is there's only been one nation and there will only be one nation that's ever had a covenant relationship with God. It's Israel. We see that in Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. And all the other nations are pagan. And Israel right now is living as a pagan nation because they've rejected Messiah. So instead of looking to Christianize America, that's not what we're looking to do. What we're looking to do, uh, contrary to the post-millennialist, is to simply preach the gospel and let God sovereignly use it to save a people that he is going to later incorporate into the kingdom when Christ returns. Yes. It's really so much more simple than they make it. Yeah. If Christ... The incarnate, the raised, resurrected Christ is not physically on the earth reigning. The kingdom hasn't come. Amen. You can't have the kingdom without a king on the earth. Otherwise, you have a bunch of people claim, claiming they speak for the king, trying to rule, but they don't speak for him because we believe in Scripture alone. We That's have right. Scripture tell us what to do, and the Scripture isn't telling us to build a kingdom and force the pagans to serve us. Amen. Amen. And Bob, as you said that, I know some of the post-millennials, they'll they'll react to what you and I are saying, and they'll say, well, didn't Jesus say that his kingdom is not of this world, and therefore he must be reigning now from heaven? And we agree that in one sense he is reigning from heaven at the right hand of God. But the promise in eschatology, the promise for the future, is in the book of Revelation from the throne room, we shall reign upon the earth. But it's future, as Bob said, it's when Jesus Christ returns bodily, that's when our reign comes. Our reign over other humans does not happen during the church age. It happens when the Lord Jesus returns and establishes a glorious kingdom. So again, what I see the post-millennialists doing is substituting God's gracious work in Christ with their human works. They're going to do it. What state will we be in when we do reign with Christ? Yeah, our glorified. We'll be resurrected. Amen. Okay, so the kingdom isn't run by sinners. It's run by the redeemed who are resurrected. Amen. And are different. Well, as we continue, let's continue on this. We covered how will be your name. Now let's look at the Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Now, again, we're going to have a huge disagreement with uh, Bill Johnson, the New Apostolic Reformation, the Dominionists, the Kingdom Now advocates, the Christian Reconstructionists, the whole, all of post-millennialism we're yeah. disagreeing with. Okay? So, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is God's will done on earth as it is in heaven now through the actions of the church? It hasn't. No. It's never happened. Did it happen that way through Israel? No. No. It, no. it hasn't. It's not going to happen ultimately till the eternal order of affairs, but during the millennium, Christ will be ruling with resurrected saints. But even at the end of the thousand years, there's a rebellion. Some people are still living out their lives in ordinary human fashion. They're still sinners. Yes. And so this means that we're asking for a different situation. We're not satisfied with this one. Yeah. And it doesn't imply your kingdom come, your will be done. doesn't imply you can uh, be in heaven, Lord. We're going to make your kingdom come and your will be done. Just watch us. We're going to do it. Right. Great point. It's not what it says. Right. The holiness of God's name is vindicated by God himself through his mighty deeds. We I quoted a passage of Ezekiel last week about that. There are many others in the Old Testament about God vindicating the holiness of his name. Here's one, Isaiah yeah. 29, 23. But when he sees his children, the work of his hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. Indeed, they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, stand in awe of the God of Israel. The mighty deeds right. of God show up. That's uh, Isaiah 29, 23. It shows being in awe of what God's done. Yeah, yeah, okay. amen. We're pretty good at making fake awe, but not the real thing. Yeah. You know right. why there are so many unbelievably expensive cathedrals in the world? Fake they're transcendence, trying, yeah. Yeah, they're trying to create fake transcendence. Yeah, absolutely. You go into this massive thing. One thing you can count on in cathedrals is really bad acoustics. <laughs> That's right. Because it doesn't matter if you hear the word anyhow. That's beside the point. Right. So you have the incense and the lights and the whatever's going on. And you have, oh, wow, isn't this awesome? This is awesome in the sense of what man can make. Yeah. But that's not the kind of awe that the Bible's talking about. That's right. It's talking about the actual glory of God when he brings his mighty uh, salvation on the face of the earth and rules with redeemed and glorified saints. That's right. So you read that in the book of Revelation. So your kingdom come is a prayer for the return of Christ. Amen. Absolutely. Okay, so That's Eric, right. have you heard people say that those who pray like we're talking are defeated Christians because they're not willing to do their own job? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Bob. And what I typically see with post-millennialists is they will claim that you and I will rebut and say, hey, the worst has not yet happened in the world yet. Jesus talks about the worst coming upon the world in Matthew 24, 21. Well, post-millennialists have to take that and they have to put it in the past in 70 AD so that we can have this glorious future that they're going to build. And what Bob and I are saying is, no, if you interpret 70 AD as the coming of Christ or a partial coming of Christ, you're teaching a, a form of heresy. And the reason I say that is in, in Hebrews 9.28, the writer of Hebrews is very clear that Christ comes twice. The second time that he comes is not to remove sin, but to save us who have been spared by the, the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Well, in preterism, which backs up post-millennialism, the idea is that, well, all the bad things happen in 70 AD, 
Therefore, when Jesus says, upon this world to come such tribulation such as never occurred nor ever will, that all happened in 70 AD. Well, the problem with that is if that's a parousia, well, then Christ has to come three times. He comes first to remove sins. He comes a second time to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. Well, then he has to come a third time to give us a resurrection. The writer of Hebrews says Christ comes twice, not three times, twice. And so what that does is it says 70 AD was not the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, think about 70 AD. There was one nation that succeeds in destroying Jerusalem. In Zechariah 14, there are many nations in the future that will come against Jerusalem, but they fail. Well, how can the post-millennialist be such a good Bible student if one nation named Rome succeeded in destroying Jerusalem? How can they say that that's the same as many nations failing to destroy Jerusalem because the Messiah intervenes, as we see in Revelation 19, Zechariah 14? So just at a cursory reading of eschatology, 70 AD is not any form of the return of Christ. It's not the worst time period ever. We're still looking for that. And if we're looking for the worst time period ever prior to the return of Christ, why is the post-millennialist falsely teaching that things are going to get better and better and better as we take over? No, I don't see it's going to get better at all. The biblical data is clear. It's not obscure. The worst time period is yet in the future, just prior to Christ coming to rescue us. If the post-millennialist is right that we're going to be so successful, why is everything going to get worse? And why do we need the rescue? Well, there's another obvious problem. Are they claiming Jesus actually was on the earth in 70 AD in his glorified body? Did, Great point. Exactly. Did anybody it's see absurd. Christ in 70 AD? Right. It's absolutely absurd. Well, they don't even claim that. So how could they say he came? Exactly right. And they say it's spiritual and the... One of the big problems, of course, is in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, we see that when Christ does return at his parousia, he destroys the Antichrist with the splendor of his coming. They know that never happened in 70 AD. They know it did. And so they just have to change the subject and say, well, we just don't know, have enough historical data about 70 AD. That's usually what they claim. You know what's really sad is whoever is sitting in churches where these sort of things are taught, they're not growing and learning. They're just spinning their wheels. Yeah. Uh, if that's how the pastors and theologians treat the Bible, which is very shamefully, do they even care what it actually says? That's right. Sometimes well I wonder, I've debated pastors in uh, some other kind of uh, theologies, and it became clear they didn't really care what it said. Right. Well that said, Bob. For me, frankly, I would have stayed in chemical engineering. I had yeah. left Christianity as I knew it, out of which was liberal Christianity, which I was never that excited about. I was just a kid, but they didn't believe there were any miracles, and they didn't believe the Bible was true, and they didn't believe the the good Lord would send anybody to hell, and they believed yeah. everybody's basically good. And they're just trying to do their best, and we're here to help them. Yeah. Okay, bye. I'm out of here. Right. <laughs> I, don't need, I don't need to go to church for this. Right. The chemical engineering and then was dramatically converted by God's grace. But if I didn't believe the Bible is true, I'd be right back where I, the liberals were. That's right. Or if I believed it was true, but it's not worth wasting my time doing the study of the word. Yeah. So I can apply it. And we're going to show you right here that the application is valid and it's helpful for all Christians. Amen. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. That's what we want. But we need yes. the Lord to do it. Amen. Okay. Amen. But what about our needs in the meantime? That's verse 11. Let's go to the next verse. Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, so... I did a bunch of research on this. I may still write an article on it. I'll see about that. But I ended up writing on the Great Commission. But when I was looking at this, bread isn't the only thing. It's probably a figure of speech uh, called a synecdoche, where a part stands for a bigger whole. Okay. Yeah. So bread would then, especially in their world where that was a big deal, 
labor for bread. Jesus talked about that in John. They were yeah. got a better bread. Now, uh, would be, stand for the physical needs that we have to survive on the face of the earth. Amen. Okay. So I think that's the best reading that it's a synecdoche for our physical needs. Absolutely. And Bob, you're in good. I think you're exactly right. I think that that bread is exactly a summary of all that we need. Uh, another place I was just going to mention where you see the idea of a synecdoche is in 1 Peter 3.21, where it says that we have a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And some of us might ask ourselves, well, wait a minute, what about the death of Christ? Isn't that necessary? Well, the resurrection is a synecdoche. Uh, it, right. It's a, right. assuming all of Christ's work, because if he's been raised, he obviously has lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death. Everything is implied in the synecdoche. The one term, as Bob said, summarizes the whole. So the resurrection stands for the whole of Christ's work. In the same way, Bob is exactly right. The bread is a summary of all of our needs. And what a beautiful thing to pray for. But it seems to be beneath the post-millennial, isn't it? No, the post-millennial is their need is to rule over others. <laughs> right. And then create heaven on earth through their activities. But that's not right. one of our needs. Right. Okay, so daily bread and forgive us our debts is we've forgiven our debtors. Now, debts in uh, this kind of context is our debt toward God. Amen. Our debt to sin, yes. our need for forgiveness, our need for release from sin. And uh, so our spiritual needs involve the need for forgiveness and the need to live lives as forgiven people who extend forgiveness to those around us. Wow. Not exacting revenge in order to get what we think we've got coming. Yeah. So, yeah. in a sense, well, we're praying for God to bring, vindicate the holiness of his name. Hallowed be thy name is a, for him to come and vindicate the holiness of his name by uh, his return. Yes. Defeating his enemies. In the meantime, we're praying for simple needs. Our, the bread, our basic needs to live on the earth. Yes. And our debts being forgiven so that we're living as forgiven people before God and we're right before him. So we're ready for his return. Amen. Amen. And we're and the way we treat others reflects these truths. That's so well said, Bob. I was thinking about as you're saying that we have to be those who are forgiving others of their sins. That's the kind of people we are to be as Matthew 6 12, you know, praise as Christ prays in Matthew 6 12, because we've been forgiven so much. And what's interesting about that is the only way that we can be forgiving is if we allow for a future vengeance that God will bring. Right. A lot of us cry out. We see um, there was that mass murder of school children in Tennessee where Christian children were murdered by a transgendered individual. And one of my challenges to the amillennialist out there was how can we be ruling and reigning now when you have school kids that are being murdered? Isaiah 2 promises that one day the swords will be beaten into plowshares, the spears into pruning hooks, and no longer is there going to be the nations learning war. There's not going to be death on the holy mountain. The only way Christians can say, you know what, I can forgive this most egregious deed done to me or to others is to know that Christ is going to return. And when he returns, there is going to be a justice that's meted out. We don't have to be the ones who meet it out now. If the post-millennial is right, then we should not always be forgiving because we have to be the ones who bring justice to the earth. But if Bob and I are correct, then we can somehow be those, by God's grace, who are forgiving and knowing that God is going to return in Christ in the future. He's going to make sure that justice is done. Well, those are two different worldviews. Yes, and frankly, according to the Bible, God uses civil government to punish evildoers. Yeah. You see that in the book of Romans. And it was not that there are no civil authorities. Yeah. And there were in the time of the apostles. But Paul, when he was called before the civil authorities, 
was testifying about Christ. Amen. And so the civil authorities, it's their job to punish the evildoers, to restrain evil. And we pay taxes, pray for civil leaders, so as much as possible we live peaceably on the earth. Right. We want that. We're not pacifists in the sense that we don't think evil should be punished. Absolutely, yeah. Good point. Yeah. But that's the job of the civil government. And yeah. New Testament doesn't say it's the Christian's job to run the civil government. That's right. We're not that's saying right. God can't use Christians in that occupation if, if that's what happens. But it's pretty rare. It can happen. But yeah. we're so at odds with the world, they're unlikely to want us. Yeah. We can see that's that right. now. They hate us. They hate everything we believe. Yeah, and then that's part of the spirit of Antichrist is the spirit of lawlessness that we see in the world today where the decent more often are arrested and those who are indecent are often let go. Uh -huh. I think about there was a man named Daniel Penny. He ends up restraining someone who's attacking people on the subway. We see him thrown in jail, but the people who are attacking others on the subway, they're often let out. I know. And that grieves us. It grieves us like Lot was grieved when he saw the wickedness. What Bob and I are saying is there's going to be a day where there's a holy one in Israel who rules and reigns, and you're not going to have perverted justice. You're not going to have a justice system that doesn't function properly. What we're saying is it will function properly. That perfect vengeance and justice of God will come. You and I have to be content with saying, you know what, I have to be one who's forgiving because I've been forgiven much here and now. That's how we're going to live. That's exactly how we live. And I have to keep reminding myself of the passage. says, the Lord said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And Paul said, uh, they run for the wrath of God. Exactly. Romans 12, 19. Amen. That's yeah, don't exactly Don't take your right. own vengeance. Yeah. You, you end up like the pagans where it just escalates violence as you try to get revenge. Yes. So this is the Lord's Prayer is very significant. Amen. This isn't just something you say over and over again to prove you're pious. Yeah. But it's full of theological content. So yeah. those of you that have an interest in it, maybe you bought the app that you saw on the TV commercial, get a good translation of the Bible. We're using the American Standard. It has a good translation of the Lord's Prayer here. And study what it actually says. Yeah. And what does it mean? We What do we need? We need forgiveness. What do we need? We need God's provision. Yeah. Okay. And then it goes to verse 13 here. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Literally says, deliver us from the evil one. Yeah. Okay. And then there's this ending. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There's some textual dis discussion about that ending. Did you know that, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's original or not. Yeah, some of the old street texts did not have it on there. Yeah. And it was, some scholars think it was added later when it became part of liturgy. Right, right. So uh, whatever you think of that, it's certainly not wrong to describe the kingdom to God and the glory to God, but it probably wasn't yeah. part of this. Right. That's Do not lead us into temptation. Let's quickly look at that. I have here my notes from the Greek. Might bring, I looked up that word, and yeah. it's an air subjunctive. It's It would be don't bring us there. I'll tell you what I believe that is about. Don't yeah. overly... Uh, inflated in your mind about your own ability to withstand temptation. Right. In other words, you're humbly saying, don't lead me there. I'm not making any great claims about how I would do. Yes. Jesus That's very overcame important. every temptation. That's unique to him. Right. We need Jesus. Amen. And so you're not being a boastful, man, that would, I would never do that. Well, we think about some horrible things we probably wouldn't do. There's a lot of things we would do. 
And we don't yeah. really want to be there. Amen. Okay. Yes. So, but, so in you can't, but Allah is a Greek conjunction. It's a disjunctive. It means strong contrast. Yeah. It's strong contrast to being brought into temptation is this word my rescue. I, that's a cool word. I like that word. I do too. Rescue. Yeah. Ruamai. And it's imperative in the Greek. Okay? Imperative. Rescue us from and then there's a, a definite article uh, it's a genitive but if we just put it in the dictionary entry Apaniras, the evil or implied the evil one. That's right. Okay, so the imperative is um, the need for rescue because testing is inevitable. Amen. And you can think of Jesus' interaction, interaction with Peter. Peter was overly confident that, that he, he would never fail, but he did. The Lord predicted it. But when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. Yeah. And so there's plenty here. Uh, Jesus was in te was tempted in all things. Matthew 4, 1 through 13, but he overcame all of them. Amen. And so the lesson, uh, listeners, is that the Lord's Prayer is telling us to depend on the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I need rescue. You need rescue. Rescue is not a bad thing. No, no, we need rescue. We need rescue. Rescue yeah. is from evil. And so rather than walking into somewhere we shouldn't be and counting on our own uh, virtue to, to be all that we need, we're humbling ask, asking God to keep us and to rescue us from the evil one because this testing is inevitable. Amen. That's so well said. And Bob, it's so beautiful is I think Peter builds off of this in 2 Peter 2 9, where he uses the same term for deliver. He uses ruamai, you know, rescue us. And he uses even the term perasmos, the term temptation that's rendered here in Matthew 6 13. And so there's going to be a great rescue in the future prior to the perasmos, the trial that comes upon the whole world. In fact, that's the same term that's used in Revelation 3 10, where we will be kept from the hour of perosmos that comes upon the whole world. And so like Bob is saying is this is both now, during the church age, we depend upon God to rescue us from being overcome by the evil one. And we're also depending on him to rescue us prior to the trial, the future 70th week of Daniel that comes upon the whole world. It says to test those who dwell upon the earth. That phrase, those who dwell upon the earth in Revelation 3.10, occurs nine times in the book of Revelation. And each time it's referring to the unregenerate. The unregenerate are going to be abandoned to go through that trial and they're going to fail. And they're going to be judged. But as Bob's pointing out, we're going to be rescued. Yes, the Bible teaches rescue. We're to pray for rescue both now and in the future. Praise be to God that he answers this prayer. Because we, we need them. Yes, as, thanks for pointing that out. And that ties together the eschatology. Yes. As we live our daily life, give us our daily bread and uh, forgive us as we forgive others. Remove our debt, the debt of sin. We see the, our need, but we see the need for the return of Christ to rescue us. Amen. Ultimately. So it's also eschat eschatological in that sense. Yes. And to, to summarize, dominion theology, a kingdom now, seven mountain mandate, invading Babylon, all of this, post-millennialism, is false, foolish, totally misguided, it's frankly naive. It's about as naive as any liberalism is. Yeah. 
And you might be able to have the things that are good to be doing that are in a civil way, having an orphanage, praise God, or having a house. Yeah. That's fantastic. But that's not the kingdom of God. Amen. And it downplays our greatest need, which is to be rescued and to have the Lord himself return and glorify his name by judging evil and rewarding what's righteous. Amen. And that's his vengeance and that's his business. And we're praying for that to happen. So search the scriptures, look at it carefully, study the text. And uh, dear listeners, you can decide who's giving the best reading based on what else you can see in the Bible. Amen. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bob, for all the hard work on this. We are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. You can access this episode and many others, as well as over 100 articles on the website, cacministry.org. While you're there, click on contact and send us a message. We would love to hear from you. We want to encourage you all to stand firm in one spirit or one mind to strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Bob DeWay and Eric Dalma. We'll see you next week. God bless you. See you next time.